because the temptation when you're in a crisis that is knocking you down is to look for other options when you don't think God is doing anything. Unbelief is so powerful. We read in chapter 13 that Jesus limited what he would do because of unbelief. Unbelief is so powerful, it'll stop God's work in your life. Another reason why God allows lack of provision in our lives in a multiple, multiplicity of arenas, areas of our lives, is because he is trying us, testing us. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 1 to 3, God says, I let you get hungry. I let your food get low so that I might test your heart. In addition to that kind of test, he goes on in that same passage and says, and I did it to humble you. In other words, to get rid of some of your self-sufficiency. One of the reasons God will allow lack, emotional lack, physical lack, financial lack, career lack, one of the reasons God will allow lack is to strike a death blow at our independence. God hates pride, and he hates when you feel like you can make it without him. And to address independence from him, he will allow your contacts not to come through, the promotion not to come through. He will allow just when you thought you had a saving for something else to break down and eat it up. He will allow lack to let you know that you are not self-sufficient. That on your best day, on my best day, you and I are dependent. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, he says in verse 8 and 9, he said, we were undergoing a great deal of affliction. We were, we were being overwhelmed to the point of death. We were going through a great deal of affliction to the point of death. God, why did you let Paul, who loved you, get that low where he didn't even think he could live anymore? Then Paul says that we might learn to trust him who raises the dead. He said he let us get that low to deepen what it means to trust God at a point we couldn't fix. So when he says wait on the Lord, he's not talking about passively sitting down doing nothing, he's talking about plotting your life. Intertwining all of your life so that everything is wrapped and intertwined with him. So that there isn't church and the rest of my week. It's God, I got started on Sunday morning, but my stuff is so messed up. My situation is so deep, I'm going to plot my circumstances, plot my decisions, plot my goals, and intertwine them with you Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and back again on Sunday. I'm not going to just straighten my hair on Sunday and let stuff blow it all week long. I'm gonna plait this thing so that it is no longer subject to the circumstances. I am going to wrap up, tie up, and tangle up my life. Because when things get bad enough, the problem won't leave you alone. I mean, I wake up in the middle of the night. I, I break out in tears two and three times or four times Throughout the day, I see a picture, it throws me off. I hear a reference, it throws me off. So I don't need what happened on Sunday. I need to be tied up with the God I met on Sunday all week long. To wait on the Lord is a hookup that you don't want to be disconnected from. In addition, it means to not go outside of God to fix it. Because the temptation 
when you're in a crisis that is knocking you down is to look for other options when you don't think God is doing anything. They said, my way is hidden from the Lord. Maybe we don't see God doing anything because we haven't platted our lives around it. When you audit a course in college, what you are saying is, I want the information without the responsibility. I want to learn whatever the course is seeking to teach, but don't give me homework and don't give me exams. I don't want the work of it, I just want the knowledge about it. You may be able to do that with college, but you cannot do that with the Christian life. You cannot audit it. What many people do is they come to church to hear the word, to be inspired by the word, but who don't plan to do any of the work. They don't want to incur any of the responsibility of it, but they like the learning about it. Well, in college, you need to know that when you audit a course, you don't get credit for it because you didn't put in what the course required. And when you audit the Christian life by coming to hear the word, to be inspired and encouraged by the word, but to not act on the word that you've heard, you may have more knowledge and you may be more inspired, but you won't be changed because the transformation in the life through the word has to be activated by obedience. Without that, it becomes information with no credit. Then let him call on the elders of the church and they are to pray over him. Ah, in verse 13, you are praying for you. Anyone suffering, let him pray. But in verse 14, you need help. Because your prayers are not getting through. In fact, you don't even feel like praying anymore. When life beats you down long enough, deep enough, you can get tired of dealing with God. Now that doesn't sound spiritual, but all of y'all know that's true. You don't feel like talking to God right now. God seems absent from you. The telephone line is off the hook. It's busy. You're not breaking through. You're just mumbling the same words over and over again. You, you feel like you're talking to yourself. He says, okay, now at that point that you hit weariness, you need more than you. So he says, go to the elders of the church. That should represent the spiritual leadership of the church to get support for a breakthrough you have not been able to get on your own. Every Sunday morning, before each of the services, the elders meet. And on a regular basis, we are praying for some member that has called to speak about their situation, their weariness, or their suffering. And so we schedule them for a time of prayer before the service that they come to. We had a prayer today from a sister who's here this morning. And the one word that was used in our time of prayer was, I'm tired. I'm tired. That's this word. That's this situation. Nothing is happening. God hasn't changed anything yet. And I'm just tired. Will you pray for me? This is when people want to give up throw in the towel. That means you need some other folk who can cry out for you because you are too tired to cry out for yourself. He says, you go call the elders of the church and let them pray because you may not be able to. That's why you are to be a part of a local church so that when you can't go on, somebody else can keep you going on. God said, it's not going to rain. God said, it's now going to rain. There's a gap of three and a half years between when he said no rain because of their idolatry 
and when it was going to rain. So watch this. The change with the rain only came when the idolatry was addressed. As long as there was idolatry, there would be no rain. Many people want God to send rain in their lives, called blessings, without wanting God to change their lives. They want God to do something for them while they remain idolaters. And remember, idolatry is any unauthorized noun, person, place, or thing that you look to to meet your needs. It is any unauthorized thing. So an idol can be a person, an idol can be a place, an idol can be stuff, money, possessions, an idol can be a job, an idol can be your career, it can be your, your position, an idol can be any noun, person, place, or thing, and you're looking to that to be your source. That's an idol. So what God has are folks who worship him on Sunday and date idols all week long. And as long as there was idolatry, God would not shift from no rain to rain. So we have people who come to church all the time looking for their blessing who don't want to be messed with by their God. And so they wonder why it won't rain. Because God's not going to rain on you so you can share it with an idol. <laughs> so before I get any further, let me explain something. When God wants to give you an encounter with him, it will typically involve a test. This is a test related to a promise. I'll explain. This test is unique because it involved a series of contradictions. A contradiction is when God says one thing and appears to be doing another. Number one, there was a theological contradiction. You see, God had promised way back in Genesis chapter 12 that he was going to make a great nation out of Abraham and it would come through the son of Sarah whose name was Isaac. God had made a promise. But here in Genesis chapter 22, God tells Abraham to kill the promise. Not only is it a theological contradiction, it is also a biblical contradiction because that's murder. To offer your son on the altar as a burnt offering means to kill him and that's murder. But isn't it you, God, who said thou shalt not kill? Isn't it you, God, who in Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, said, if any man kills another man, he shall by man be killed, for man is created in the image of God? Didn't I hear you say that? Well, if you said that over here, how are you asking me to kill him over here? Uh, that's a contradiction involved in a test. It's not only a theological contradiction, it's not only a biblical contradiction, it's an emotional contradiction. Because he says, sacrifice your son, your only son, and then he says, whom you love. My only son, you're asking me to turn over and to even take his life, that's killing my emotions. What brings, and I would add to this in, in a sense if I may, defines success that you have achieved in your ministry, and how was this accomplished? Hmm. Well, biblical success is, is accomplishing the will of God, whatever that is, and that will vary for each of us. You can do big things, you can have resources, you can have all that and be a failure because you didn't fulfill. Jesus says in John 17, I accomplished the work that my Father sent me here to do. Paul says in 2 Timothy 4, I finished my course, okay? <laughs> David, Acts 13, 36, served the purposes of God for his generation. So it is fulfilling what God calls you to do. And so because what I am doing in a local church as a model and then trying to expand that both generationally and nationally and internationally, 
given the vision that God had gave me, given the passion, given the circumstances of both my life and both what I see needs to happen in the culture, uh, God has given me a pretty clear picture of where I am to uh, leave the mark that he has given me in history. So success is accomplishing that. There are bumps along the way. There's growth along the way. There's some failures along the way. But it's still along the way. And so if you're along the way, if you're going in the way that he wants you to go to accomplish his will as he, sometimes he gives it to you. He normally gives it to you in chunks. You normally don't get the whole picture in advance. But as he gives it and as he reveals it, walking in it, learning through it, that is how I define success, and that is the measure by which uh, I, I measure it in my, my own life and ministry. Suffering means you are hurting. Something is hurting you. It could be physical hurt, financial hurt, circumstantial hurt, relational hurt. All you know is you're in pain. You are suffering. So... Just to make sure I'm not wasting my time here, let me ask you what James asked his audience. Is there anybody here this morning suffering? Yeah. Let me raise your hand. You're suffering? All right. Good. I want to make sure we, we could apply this. So for everybody who raised their hands, for those who are lying and didn't raise their hands, <laughs> and for those who will need to raise their hand tomorrow, even though they may not need to raise it today, is any among you suffering? You're going through a rough patch of life. He says, notice this, he must pray. Not he should pray, not it would be nice if he did pray. He says, you better pray. If life has fallen on you, many of these Christians were being persecuted Many were going through trials that were difficult to, to handle, and they were hurting. James says, if you are hurting because of circumstances, you must pray. Pain is always an invitation to prayer. Pain, in whatever form it takes, is always an invitation to pray. You say, well, I'm hurting all the time. That means you should be praying all the time because pain is an invitation to pray. In fact, one of the reasons God lets pain linger is to get more prayer from us. When David talks about slaying Goliath, he has a very interesting set of scenarios. He said, I was attacked, my, my flock was attacked by a lion. My flock was attacked by a bear. And when I saw my, 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 um, uh, 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 my flock attacked, he says, I ran to the bear and I ran to the lion. When Goliath shows up, it says he runs to Goliath. So now when you operate covenantally, you're no longer operating in defense. You are now become an offensive saint, not a defensive Christian. You see, the goal of being a believer, Jesus says, whatever you bind on earth, I will have bound in heaven, Matthew 16, 19. Whatever you loose on earth, I will loose in heaven. In other words, when you move, heaven will back you up. So let me explain something. Whenever God moves supernaturally in the Bible, the most normal thing you will see is God did not move until the people moved first. The people had to take an offensive posture before the supernatural showed up. God told Moses, hold out your rod and tell the people to start moving before he ever opened up the Red Sea. God told Joshua, tell the priest to put their foot in the Jordan before he ever held back the water. God told uh, 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 Peter to cast on the other side of the boat before he ever filled the nets. God told Martha to move the stone in John chapter 11 before he ever brought Lazarus from the dead. 
You see, God wants to see you walk by faith, not talk by faith. He wants you to see you move by faith, not mouth by faith. He wants to see you, your life by faith, not your lip by faith. He wants to see motion. The bridge that God has constructed for you to move from the natural to the supernatural is the bridge called faith. It is the only bridge that he has constructed. So if you don't use that bridge, you don't cross over. No matter how bad you want to cross over, no matter how much you need to cross over, without the faith bridge, you cannot move from the natural into the supernatural. Now that we have constructed the bridge, it's time to cross over. Because you can have a bridge that folk don't use. But a bridge unused becomes a useless bridge to those who need it most. And trust me, what many of us need, either in our lives or in the lives of folk we know, demands the supernatural. And the reason you know it demands the supernatural is the natural hadn't fixed it. The natural hadn't changed it, reversed it, tweaked it. It hadn't done anything substantial with it. And so it's time to cross over, but there's only one bridge, and that's the faith bridge. Now what you need to know is the power of unbelief. Because faith, if it's the only bridge, and you don't have it, unbelief will keep you stuck where you are. Unbelief is so powerful, we read in chapter 13, that Jesus limited what he would do because of unbelief. Unbelief is so powerful, it'll stop God's work in your life. Unbelief is so powerful, it'll keep God at a distance. Unbelief is so powerful that you can spend the rest of your life stuck where you are and never cross over to see the supernatural. What's up guys? Thank you for more one episode. I want to really encourage you to share this episode with your friends, church friends, family, Facebook groups, Instagram, helping us to reach you and bless more brothers and sisters around the world. And if you have any comments, advice, put in comments, please. Thank you so much.